So I founded Henny uh, Publishing, which is essentially trying to disseminate art into the world. And it uses the latest technology to do so. Uh, I, I believe in art. I believe in art being important to get through life. It helps, you know, spiritually. There are lots of philosophical questions about art, which we all ask ourselves every so often, like, what is art? I can't answer that, but I know it touches me. There are other questions raised by um, the prints that I do about what is originality, what is an original work of art, and what is um, a print of that art. And can you, especially in this day and age, with the ease of which, with which you can reproduce images, whether the reproduction loses something from the original? Um, other questions which I think I'd ask you to keep in your mind as I make this short presentation. Uh, does the hand of the artist have to be involved in the creation of a work of art, or is it simply the mind of the artist in the creation? This is, although many people won't realize it, technologically a historic moment for the making of prints. For hundreds of years, prints have been made in a relatively mechanical process, largely in, in, in Europe, in Germany. The first prints were made in the 13th century using woodcuts. Then, in about the 1430s, metallic plates were created, and many of the German artists were the leading um, producers of prints, from Albrecht Dürer, but other artists like Goya and Raphael also made prints. The next development in printmaking possibly was photography in about the 1830s, and then lithographic prints, and then subsequently screen prints. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about the technology of printmaking, nor the philosophy of it, but I'm going to show you some prints that I've made, and then maybe that way it can trigger thoughts in your mind. The first print, or two prints, I'm going to bring up, and don't remember the questions I asked about what, what is a print, does it lose its... In about the 1920s and 30s, there was a German philosopher called well, Walter Benjamin, I think he was German, and he said in this essay called Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, that if you reproduce a print, you lose its aura. If you reproduce a painting as a print, you lose its aura. I don't accept that. I think, personally, that you create... It has its own aura, even as a print, and it's actually very hard to copy something and not have originality in that copy. So the first thing I'll show you is this print, which is a painting by Richter, which is one of the first prints we did in Henny. The original painting is 92 centimeters by 126, and it's, it's now reproduced in exactly the same way as the painting. I say exactly, same size, same colors, but actually, the decision to produce it like that, which is an artist's decision, because he approves the print, creates another work of art in a sense, even though it's a copy. Um, the design, the, 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 sh the glossiness of the paper, if you had the original next to it, you could tell the difference in this particular case. For those interested in technology here, as many of you are, to photograph that painting uh, and reproduce it took 713 photographs. This was done four or five years ago. Each photograph was about 200 meg, and the overall image was 92 gig, which probably many of you have never heard of or seen. That means that painting could be blown up to be bigger than the whole of this wall and not lose any detail at all. In the bottom left-hand corner of this painting, there's a dead fly which we didn't know existed. It's on the painting, and if we blew it up, it would be the size of my hand, and you could see every detail in its wing. And so that's... The technology there is not just the photography of it, it's the stitching of the different photographs together to create a homogenous image, which is all color balanced. That's if you can take that one away, and I'll just... This is the next print, which is also a Richter print, which is kind of fascinating, because in this case, if you had the original painting next to it, you couldn't tell the difference, because the original painting is painted behind glass, and this is behind glass, too. You could not physically tell which was which. The only twist to the tale is the original painting broke, which was kind of upsetting, and Richter wasn't sure whether to have the original as broken and just accept it as a work of art, but what we decided to do in the print was digitally recreate the painting, which doesn't exist anymore. It didn't exist at the time we created this. We photographed the damaged painting, and we fiddled around with it in Photoshop and other, however the designers do it, to make a print. Now, the print doesn't correspond to an external reality anymore. The reality is broken. So that's an interesting philosophical question about, you know, what is the art? Does this have an aura? It would look exactly the same as the original. The original doesn't exist anymore. If you could get me the other, the bacon over. 
So this is, I'm going to show you four prints. This is the third one now, which is for Francis Bacon, for the Francis Bacon's estate. Now, immediately, there's a philosophical difference. Francis Bacon's dead. His estate can make prints of his paintings. And so it's good to make them as close as you can to the reality. These prints, when I finish my talk, will be put on the other side of that wall, and I'd invite you to go and have a look at them, and you feel free to touch them, especially the bacon one, because it's kind of shocking when you touch it, because it looks like it's 3D, and yet it's 2D. Um, bacon had all his paintings behind shiny glass and in a gold frame, so you had to decide whether we were going to try and do that. We decided not to do that, because that would just look like a fake, because if we did, did that, you really could not tell the difference between a bacon and the print. Do you turn it around? This is a painting of Henrietta Moraes, who was a drug addict. And the real painting would be worth about $50 million. Um, this is the needle in her hand, in her arm. And when you touch it, it looks like it sticks out, but it's an amazing painting. And we deliberately kept it to look like a print. We could have made it look identical to the original, and you could not, within 10 centimeters of it, tell the difference. Do you want to get the last um, print? So the last, uh, the last print is to me one of the most interesting prints because, again, the artist is no longer involved. The artist is a German artist who was born in Augsburg in 1497. And he painted this painting, which you're about to see, um, in about 1532, when he went over to England uh, to be part of the court of Henry VIII. And the painting's in the National Gallery in England. And we're doing a collaboration with the National Gallery to make a perfect reproduction of it, as perfect as we can. It was painted on oak. It's nearly 500 years old. It's by Hans Holbein the Younger, and it's called The Ambassadors. But what you're about to see is the prototype of it. The final one will be even better than the one you're about to see, I believe, and it'll be look identical to the one in the gallery. What this enables people to do is experience and see a painting which they could never normally see in their own home, and to study it closely, and to live with it, Francis Bacon, for example, only in his lifetime painted 584 paintings. And you have to be, really, a very wealthy man to own a Francis Bacon. But now, with the prints, you can actually experience them and study them and live with them and be touched by them in your own house. And I hope it's the same for the Holbein. This is not the final one, but it's pretty good. Um, do you want to turn it around, guys? That we br <laughs> it's funny that we bring it back to near Augsburg after 500 years. Do you want to just push it back a little bit against a little bit? You probably know the story. It's kind of very topical at the moment with Brexit because it's to do with the ambassadors and Henry VIII about to break with the Roman Catholic Church because he wanted to get married again. And um, it's an amazing painting. There's so much detail which you could never see it in, in real life because you can never get that close to it. And you can actually have this now as a print in your living room. There's even a little crucifix here, which I love this painting, but I'd never noticed it until I had the print in my study. And there's so much you don't notice, and you can spend hours studying it and looking at it. And you know, for me, I'm so proud to be able to allow people to enjoy great art through this, um, basically, printmaking. Now, I'll give you an example, which I don't have here, of a painting by Richter called the which we also did a print of, which was Titian did a painting called um, The Annunciation, which is the moment the Archangel Gabriel came to visit Mary. Richter found a postcard of that painting. He never saw the painting, so he's already taking an image of the image, and he painted a fantastic painting, which many of you might know. He then decided to make a print with me of that painting. And as we made a painting, which is an exact replica of the... Of, as we made a print, an exact replica of the painting, you had all sorts of questions which Richter would have to decide, like, do you airbrush out the damage that is already on his painting because it's 30 or 40 years old, or, you do, or do you keep it in? He decided to keep it in because it's a, a replica of the painting as it is now. So it's actually very hard to recreate a painting to make a total copy of it without having its own originality and decisions about how you frame it, what you do to it, what, what you know, it, it, there's no such thing as just a copy that doesn't have its own originality, I think, especially if an artist is alive and decides and directs how it's made. I don't know how much time I've taken, but 
I think I was only meant to take 10 minutes, but basically I think I've, asked, I've said everything I want to say, but Hans Ulrich said he wanted to ask me some questions, but I don't mind taking questions for, what, for one minute if anyone wants to ask questions. Anyone want to ask questions? Right, then I will call my little uh, presentation to an end.